Hello, everyone, and welcome back to NetApp On Air. As always, my name is Nick Howell. Thank you so much for joining us today. we got an exciting one for you today. We've been doing this show for going on 18 months now, and i got to say, we've been pretty lax on bringing in some outside folks. Mostly it's been NetApp people and our product managers and engineers, which you guys love. You guys love all that kind of stuff. But we got a special one for you today uh, because I, I just I can't wait to talk about this topic. I'm very excited about it. So we're not going to be talking about NetApp stuff today. We're going to be talking about virtualization. Yes, virtualization as a wider topic. VMware, open source, other alternatives, etc. We're going to be going over all of that stuff today. But first, we got to get you in our Discord. Come join us in our Discord community. We got about 5,000 people in there talking about NetApp, products, virtualization, cloud, Kubernetes, artificial intelligence, everything is, is on the table. We've got executives, we've got engineers, we've got a lot of staff members and support staff in there. So come join us in our Discord community. It is the place to be, and it's the place to keep up with everything NetApp on air and Insight later this year and more things coming soon throughout the year this year. Uh, make sure you follow us on all the socials. It's 2024. You guys know how to do that stuff at this point. Um, come follow me on TikTok. I do make a lot of fun content over there as well. But without further ado, um, I want to introduce this gentleman, and I want to I set this up before I bring him on and, and pay him a little bit of a tribute here if I can. So my guest today is a fellow YouTube creator. Um, so near and dear to my heart already. And he is also a, has a history with virtualization as an admin, near and dear to my heart as well. Um, and at the same time, uh, he has been very outspoken in a sense of uh, knowing what was coming. Um, the, the way that I really connected with him on this topic was um, earlier this year, he put out a video around the Broadcom announcements. And that was the one that really kind of locked me in on him. And I've watched him progress through the series of videos uh, going over and doing comparisons between VMware products and other alternatives. So if you've been watching them as well on YouTube, you might know who I'm talking about already. So let's get him on here. Uh, welcome to the show, Rich. Uh, Mr. Rich Teslo, thank you very much for joining us from the Two Guys Tech YouTube channel. How you doing, man? I'm doing great, Nick. Thank you so much. That was uh, quite the introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> You're welcome, man. and I, I thank you for making all of the content that you do. Um, I know a lot of people out there appreciate it, not just us silly home labbers that have this kind of garbage in our in our rooms, in our houses, but uh, a lot of people out there in the enterprise space also appreciate those kinds of different perspectives, um, especially end user and practitioner um, ex exhaustive comparisons between stuff like uh, some of the stuff that you've been doing. So. Um, give us some background on Rich. What do you, how do you, how would you describe yourself? More of a YouTuber, more of an enterprise practitioner, somewhere in between? Well, I, like, um, for me, my background starts initially as just like a lot of people who get into technology, well, they just have a passion for it, end up using it as a, or going through it as a career, right? And, yeah. and, and building yourself up. And so my history starts with everything back as you know, as a, as a sysadmin and MCSE. And then later when VMware really took over and virtualization became uh, not just a neat niche thing, but the industry standard for, for infrastructure and data center, you know, VCP certified and, and just really fell in love with that technology. So at heart, I'm just a, a big nerd like everybody else, like yeah. tearing things apart, trying to figure out how they work. That's, that's if I didn't love it, I don't know if I would do it, right? Um, and then YouTube stuff kind of, for me came later in life more of a like i have all of these passions and i kind of a natural extrovert i guess in a way when it comes to like wanting to share these things so if, if i'm really excited about something well i'm just gonna start talking to people about it so and then from there it was a natural evolution into where i am today of being deep into these specifically into these topics that you know affect so many people yeah including myself and that's, that's a great way to encapsulate it. It's you're sort of sharing the journey that you're going on through mm -hmm. through these technologies. And along the way, you I think the way people build audiences, it's certainly the way I have is do you find kindred spirits that are also that find your content because they're going on that same journey. And then you compare notes and then you start a discord. And ne next thing you know, there's 500 people in there and maybe a thousand people are in there. You're exactly. all you. That's how communities get built. And it's one of the things that I love about it because you just share those journeys. You share the experiences. Different people have different experiences. And it's really what made the V community what it ultimately became in the early days. 
-hmm. because we didn't guys you got to remember 20 years ago like yeah there was google but there wasn't a stack overflow there wasn't an internet full of solutions on how to do things um we kind of just had to lock ourselves in the data center and figure it out and so when vmware came along it was really the first time that i really saw a real community and uh, come come into the foray so we had the forum vmware community forums we had the rise of twitter and social media um, everybody started doing their own blogs like there was this kind of sweet spot in the late 2000s early 2010s where all of that started to happen at the same time and that was one of the things that really kind of i i can't talk about that i can't talk about my career without giving that a huge credit um to that and i think it's where i'm going with this is i think it's why we all keep vmware as a company as a community as a product suite very near and dear to our hearts um mm -hmm. because it really has affected tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of people in that career path that we've all oh, similarly yeah. been on for the last 20 years so yeah i i completely agree you know you know i in the beginning when i had made videos that were about the changes coming and there were basically there was the announcement of the acquisition and uh just kind of going over and this is man this is a long time ago now at this point right uh it feels it like february it, i think it was when you put that one up uh, the the first one was at like it was november of that year that it was announced um but then it was all theoretical like what's going to happen there was the naysayers there were the people who were like oh no vmware is too important to have broad come come through and change or wreck or do what they did to the previous acquisitions and then then when it actually happened it was you know the 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 switch the 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 entire change that that the broadcom had done to vmware things just kind of kind of really locked in and the thing that um really spoke to me about the community and the people was i, I made a video and the video was basically i think it was titled something to the effect of like it's been a rough week yeah. and that rough week and and i had the the genesis of that video so i was sitting on the couch, just complaining to my wife. I'm like, man, all these things, I've got to try to figure out what to do now. Licensing has changed. And like in, in my day job, because I have a day job, just like most of the people like the, YouTube is, is, is secondary to the work that I do on a regular basis and the people I answer to in the, the business that I work for. And she says, my wife says to me, she says, you should just make a video and just tell people how you feel. And I looked at her, and I said, this is the internet. Only bad things happen when you're when you make yourself vulnerable. But right. she's like, no, just try it. And and I did. And it was the complete opposite of what I expected. It was a immediate outpouring of people who were in the same situation that me and, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of, of other people were in. And I was just like, wow, it was it was stunning. It, it changed my a bit of my opinion on 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 the human race when it comes to like <laughs> doing that sort of thing. So that was really the inflection point for me it's like you know i it's not just me like the the things that have happened my my growth of my career and my affinity and emotional connection for a piece of software yeah uh, it's more than that there's there's actually something real to this and so from there it's just been how can i work with the you know help these people how can i help myself and go through this journey of what do i do now what what do i recommend in my business what do i recommend to other people when they ask me and what do i do at home in my own home lab and here we are. Well, it's a great introduction. It's a great start to the series of content that, that you put out there. Um, what have you, so most of what I have seen has been secondhand in a way. I have certainly have had, being at NetApp, I've certainly had customer conversations at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I've even contributed a, we'll leave it at a memo. Uh, internally to our leadership and and engineering organizations as to what I think would be a right path and those conversations are still going on to this day literally okay. half an hour ago I was on a meeting talking about some of this kind of stuff so all of that is is getting figured out from our perspective and I'll go over some of that that I can talk about today and be kind of transparent about where we're at but where are you at as an admin and practitioner, having gone through this exercise, before we get into the details of like what you went through, kind of okay. give me a rich state of the union of where you're at as a virtualization admin when it comes to the options that are in front of you right now. This is a tough one. Um, I, I wanna, I'll, I'll preface this by saying that 
things are still very much in flux in terms of, of alternatives and options for people. There has been, unlike anything I've seen in my professional career within the past six months, this massive swell of development and engineering to try to make up the differences that, you know, VMware for the, for the longest time has always been the 800 pound gorilla in the market, right? Yeah. They, you know, for, and completely deservedly, like this is not like a, oh, they're just, they're crushing competition. Like they're crushing competition because they're great and their, their, their products were great. And I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll die on that hill for that. Um, I will but, too. I'll be right there with you. And, you know, and now that there's, you know, the, the, the silver lining of this is now that there's an opportunity for others in this space, whether it's in the open source or even the, the, the closed source uh, virtualization markets to basically get their A game together. They no longer necessarily need to just live in the niche of it, in the shadow of, of VMware, because you know there's an opportunity to grow in the way they, they've been doing that. Is you're just seeing so much development, not just the, the Proxmox and the XCPNG side of things where they're like adding VMware conversion tools into their UIs to just migrate workloads, but getting on board with real enterprise level things like getting integrations to Veeam, something that's really important for you know, any enterprise lives on their backups. Like no matter what anyone says, that is a cornerstone of your, of your operation. And those platforms never supported those enterprise tools. And now you're seeing like just lots of collaboration and things are changing dramatically. So yeah, but the state of the union for me is still a little bit undecided. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I know I need to move and the organization that, that I, I work for, you know, I, is, is that driven by cost? The need to move? Um, yeah, well, it's all driven by cost. I mean, fundamentally, when it comes down to it, the, the big impetus for people to move is the fact that, that their, their licensing bills have, you know, I can speak for myself, I'm, you know, you can go to Reddit and you can see all the, the sad stories of, of nonprofits and, and education really getting hit really bad in a way that they just, they can't. But even, you know, in the, in the, the enterprise space that I work in, like, there was a it was a four to five x uh, price change, and there are no new features. There's no there's no value add for a customer um, in that situation. So you're left going, well, can I ride out the next couple of years until the rest of the market matures in a way that it's more cost effective, or do I have to eat VCF or VVF licensing? Right. So yeah, it's tough. So it that's really still is. kind of in flux uh, on your side as far as which direction, which path to take. Um. Yeah, I, I, the the expectation is, or the hope is that, uh, you know, at, at a worst case scenario, uh, Broadcom will get some more years. They'll get maybe three years out of it uh, in their their subscription licensing, and then from that point on, the company will move because uh, you're looking at a situation where most organizations couldn't move in in the short enough period of time. You just you just can't lift and shift and train your staff and make sure that you are not making a rash decision by just jumping because of it. So it, it's people, a lot of people like that I'm, I work with now, they're, they're eating the next three years, but they're telling their, their Broadcom reps that this is it. You get mm. your, you're getting your pound of flesh and then we're moving to something else. So another one was, so cost was one thing. We, that's the one, the prevailing one that I've seen, whether right. it was on hearing the stories you mentioned on Reddit, uh, other little sub communities that I participate in just or publicly outspoken companies that are you know their executives are taking to linkedin to call out the mm -hmm. the the nature of it the other part of it uh hugo left a comment here on youtube thank you for that um how, did you were you affected in any way by whether it was carbon black or whether it was horizon view any of the products that they decided to curtail um was that did you get directly affected by any of those Thankfully not uh, close because there was a period of time where we were evaluating, looking at horizon either in Azure for, you know, contractor desktop kind of stuff, or yeah. even just handling because the organization I work for is a manufacturing company. So there's, there's a valid use case for having thin terminals out on the, uh, the shop floor. But so I, in carbon black, uh, to be honest with you, uh, the 800 pound grill in that market in the EDR market is, is CrowdStrike. So, um, yeah, that was something that, that didn't even come into the radar, but I, in my community with the people who I've been interacting with, they're 
healthcare companies with 10,000 virtual desktops that were just panicking. And now granted, they've, they've sold off Horizon to a investment firm, I think, who'd end up purchasing it. So there's possibly hope, but it didn't sound like Carbon Black was going to make it. Yeah. I know there were a lot of people excited about the future and the potential of it. Um, it hadn't quite gotten to where everybody sort of hoped it would get to, but I know there was a lot of hype around it, a lot of potential uh, for it. Uh, and I know that they're continuing on. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, I believe it was on LinkedIn a month or so ago, I saw that they're, they're going to continue developing it and continue moving forward. Fantastic. I applaud that. Yeah, um, even absolutely. in these kind of circumstances, uh, as much as we all hate it. Um, okay, so we talked about cost. We talked about the... Um, the products and the suite and getting consolidated into VCF, EVF, subscription-based models and things like that. Not everybody, that's not everybody's cup of tea. Um, right. We certainly see people that favor a managed subscription model over um, uh, something that's a more perpetual three-year refresh capital investment. We've certainly had the CapEx, OpEx argument for, for years and years now. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I look at this a little bit differently because this isn't a, a storage system or a stack of servers or network stack or anything that you're refreshing uh, every three years or that you're leasing or renting. This is software that has been running your infrastructure stack for 15 years, if not longer at this point. So I'm, I think there's a difference there in that conversation uh, when it comes to those two things. Because I don't know if you can just basically are you renting VMware? At this point, if you're if you're just paying a subscription for it, yeah, I yeah, is fundamentally that, that's is what that it the is. cloud on-prem model? <laughs> it really feels like it, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, it's a, a a a complete sea change when you think about the whole concept of, especially data center infrastructure, like you mentioned, because it's not just it is literally not swapping out hardware. Swapping out hardware, you have your refresh cycle, whatever that might be, and you typically stay on the same platforms. It's just the underlying compute and uh, resources that, that are improving or changing. So yeah, that, it, it does really feel like it, at, in, to my, in my opinion, the thing that it, the immediate feeling that it gave me was a sense of, of instability and risk because yeah. you, in the past with VMware, whether you were on SNS, which is basically you, you paid for your support and you've got perpetual licensing and you got the next version or you just went out and bought something simple like essentials for 300 bucks back in the day and you just had your three hosts and one vcenter server you never had to worry about the rug being pulled out underneath you right and it was never a concern um whereas in a subscription model especially for people who are familiar with with cloud services like azure like if something happens and your your business decides that they they don't like those prices and they decide they're not going to pay it anymore you're out of luck and you're up out of luck yeah. and back. So you're on the hook for something that, that you can't disconnect from. And I think that's right. also like a, a big part of why the licensing changeover so quickly has upset so many customers who may have potentially adapted the subscription model. If it wasn't like, okay, on this date, guess what? You're out of luck. You better move. So yeah, it, it's a scary place to be. Yeah. There's no month to month option on these subscriptions nope. as far as I'm aware. Right. So it's not Correct. like you could, it's not a it's not an on use subscription. It's not a true up of any kind, like mm -hmm. uh, you know the old Microsoft audit model used to be. There's Oracle would do the same thing, so it, there's no per user element to it. So this is it's a very weird dynamic to me, having operated it, uh, under a lot of those licensing schemes in the past, to where you would with the cloud, the it was always supposed the promise of cloud was always pay as you go, only pay for mm -hmm. what you need, what you use. Yeah. Etc. Well, what if I sign up for a, a VCF subscription for X number of sockets or cores, and I end up not needing the all of those? Like, am I just going to be wasting license subscriptions for server CPUs I'm not actually using? Like, that's something that I haven't really looked into the minutia of just yet. Is how how granular does this go down? What's your experience, Ben, when you've been looking into it? Well, my understanding is exactly what you think. If you have a stack of gear and that gear has X amount of cores in it, and if you are using vSAN or not, or it, I mean, it doesn't matter, you're going to get the, that's the, the big change in is also, you go from the a la carte to the, this is your bundle, take the bundle, which is good and bad. Like I, there are yeah. things that are good and bad to it. But that being said, if you're on a three-year license or a three-year subscription with them and you've signed that paper, 
then you decide that you are going to consolidate and dump some of your workloads into any of the cloud providers and they're not going to be using VMware. You can't get your money back. You, you've committed to that and you have that for that period of time. The only time you can adjust or true up is when you go to renegotiate that contract at whatever the new rates are and you know move forward from there. So it works more like a, an EA or a, a cloud commit like you're doing Azure, you, you, when you do a commit, uh, uh, an EA with Microsoft, for example, there's usually a certain line item in there that's a, 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 a commitment to Azure. Uh, how, much, how many dollars you're going to spend in Azure uh, on a general year. Um, so you, it's kind of like paying up front, like paying a, for a year's rent up front, but maybe you only stay there nine months. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you don't get the other three months back. And that, that's right. an interesting tack to take. And I don't know where I fall on that one just yet. I, I, we're on a NetApp YouTube channel right now. I have to come out here and say that um, we are some of the other more technical things that we're getting ready to talk about. NetApp has been partners with VMware for 20 years. That's not going to change. That's not going anywhere, to be clear. In fact, I believe we are one of a very few of the biggest partners, as far as, at least as far as storage and solutions go, with VMware. Um, we have been brothers in arms, especially since they introduced NFS support in vSphere 4. Like that was, that was huge for, for NetApp to come around. Of course we did iSCSI and we did uh, Fiber Channel SAN and stuff before that. But when NFS came around and just so coincidentally, Cisco introduced 10 gig at the time, 10 gig NFS changed the game when it comes to v, became to VMware and data stores. Now we got 40 gig and 100 gig and 400 gig. It's ridiculous what's going on out there. So just to make the point that yes, the NetApp support stance around VMware is not changing in any way that I'm aware of, at least tech from a technology standpoint. Where I want to pivot to, if we can, is some of the other alternatives and things that exercises that you've been going to going through um, for those folks that find themselves in a position where their bill has gone so high that they're forced to react and make mm -hmm. a change for those people that might be looking to refactor certain workloads into lower tiers where they, uh, an open source solution might be viable. Um, maybe not for all workloads, but for some, and that would allow them to consolidate and get their subscription licensing down, um, and, and help them in that sense. Take us through your thought process when you sat down and started mapping out the, the journey of the hypervisors that you selected to go through and maybe why you picked the ones that you did or maybe why you left out some that um, you didn't decided not to cover? Sure. So there, it basically breaks into two separate camps. You've got the, the open source hypervisors that have been around for a very long time. Uh, in, in that case, we're talking specifically like XCPNG, which is the spiritual successor to Citrix Zen and all that stuff that is built on top of those open source uh, basically those programs, those projects that were, that became added to the public trust and they're now running as a, is basically as a, a enterprise grade uh, virtualization platform, really, because it, I mean, it's, it's spiritual uh, existence comes from Citrix and Citrix back in the day with VMware, they, those two were neck and neck in the early days. Yep. And Zen then server. was the, yeah, was Zen the bee's knees. It was, um, it had a great UI too. Uh, anyway, yep. The uh, and then you have Proxmox, which is is KVM based, right? It's it's running on top of Debian, and it's it's kind of more of a, a kitchen sink. And the reason why I selected these two specifically is because they're the most mature out of like the the large community supported open source projects. They have real companies behind them that are doing real support, real customer focused work and they're not going to evaporate overnight. It's not somebody's fork that they they got mad at somebody and forked it a uh, virtualization platform and then gave up on it six months later when it got too hard. So that's kind of I, the story of XCP though. <laughs> sure. But the, the company, I, I guess, yes. However, keep in mind that when you have a, this is the weird dichotomy of open source that I, I've been talking about. It's like people need to make money to live. They don't need to be billionaires, but they, if you're going to be part of an open source project, you need to be compensated somehow because right. You can't feed yourself on ones and zeros. And so, when I look at XCPNG and I look at Proxmox, I see two two projects that are 
backed by real companies that are paying their employees real salaries. They have real support models, some better than others. And they have ambitions. They're working on these. They're not just maintaining. They are innovating and they're growing. And so that's why yeah. those two kind of come. And then you have got, been for 20 years, frankly. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, there's obviously Proxmox was a, founded in 2005. I'm not sure when Zen, the, the original Zen server project started. I know this new fork, I believe, started in 2013, 2014 for XCPNG after the whole rug pull. And then Citrix just right. couldn't make up their mind what they wanted to do. But yeah, they've been around for a long time, obviously overshadowed by VMware and um, other products and things in the market out there. But yeah, don't sleep on these two. Right. And then the the second half of that coin is the closed source virtualization that I looked at um, with Microsoft Hyper-V Hyper and uh, in Nutanix because those two are the most commonly known product names. Yeah. Right. When, you, when we talk about on the closed source, when you're excluding VMware from that list, there are other players out there who are growing the companies like scale computing and whatnot that are they are they're innovating and they have a niche that they're working in um but they're less visible in terms of of recognizable names in in the industry so so that was really you know essentially those were the the, the two groups the four hypervisors that i evaluated based on the fact that they're and i also as part of it was heavily taking in recommendations from the viewers right there was so much like but i want you to talk about proxmox i want you to talk about, talk about hyper-v i'm just like oh, okay I'll, I'll do these things and and that's one to make sure that i was hitting the things that people wanted obviously to 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 get some background and some opinions on were there any that you feel like you left out or that you'd like to revisit or do you feel like the core like the two open source the two product two commercial solutions are, are good enough do you, do you are there others out there that are more maybe edge use cases that uh, like you mentioned scale like yeah mm -hmm. but the, i mean there's there's a, I, i'm trying to think if there's other ones out there that could maybe come from behind in in this new movement um anything tickling your fancy or on your radar as far as that's concerned there were just in the course of of going through that the, the video series, I had been contacted out of band by two or three different smaller startup-esque virtualization companies that were, they had their niches that they were they were working through, but they were all KVM based mm. because that's that's easy, right? So, yeah. um, and I don't, let me be clear. When I say that's easy, I don't mean that they're lazy or that they're doing something, be, but KVM is fantastic. Yeah, like is. KVM is, and so if you don't have to worry about the actual virtualization aspect of it you can work on the other aspects of, of building a virtualization platform that that scratches whatever itch or niche that you're trying to to solve for i mean kvm is a great option so mm -hmm. but they're still shout out to rev of days of old rest in peace pour one out <laughs> there you go um but those projects after evaluating them just by myself looking through their their docs and, and talking to the, the the developers they're still proto like they're still mm. too new they they yeah. it's like one of those things that i don't think in good, good conscience i could review because it wouldn't be a fair shake because what their ambitions are weren't where they are but they can be right so instead of getting there and being like okay well this thing this is this is great whatever um i also wanted to make sure that i took into account that the options that I, were, I was looking at were options that I could see businesses of varying sizes actually adopt versus mm, taking a risk on something that may or may not be there. So, you know, that's that's where the XCPG Proxmox to some degree, but obviously the other two in the closed source, right? They certainly fit those those niches. Does um, did uh, again, you, you mentioned KVM stuff. I'm did OpenShift make it across onto your radar um, using tools like Overt, Kubevert? Again, like uh, it's KVM based at the end of the day, but sure, I th I feel like we're big partners with Red Hat um, uh, and and IBM as well. So I I look at this as Red Hat and NetApp go way back. I mean, like mm -hmm. the ultimate peanut butter and jelly partnership, uh, but uh, you know Linux and and NFS and NAS. So I look at that as an opportunity, but. I feel like has OpenShift crossed your radar at all? Because I feel like it drives things more to refactoring of workloads into containerization. That's, yeah, that's that's exactly right. So it it absolutely did. Uh, I will say, and 
and I don't mean to to anger anyone who is really emotionally connected to OpenShift, but OpenShift is a lot more complicated. There, uh, in in terms of when you when I was looking at ESXi vCenter alternatives, uh, I was looking for platforms that that had some similarity in terms of like you're still virtualizing workloads. That's the you know you've got a very very traditional hypervisor running on iron whatever that might be a management uh, system that's either vcenter or um xoa or you know or something built into the hypervisor itself when you get to openshift we start talking like you said about, about containers and about changing the way you run your workloads and yeah. sure you can use qvert you can you can go that route you can you can make your virtual machines containers and you things start to start, I feel like things get a little weird and I, I made the decision at that point that if I was going to go down that journey and talk about it, I would need to spend some significant time to refactor myself in a sense to be mm -hmm. able to do that justice because it's not an apples to apples. And that's no. not even apples to like some other fruit. You know, it's it's like there is a there's a big change that has to happen for the most part to the way you run your workloads. And that made it not really tenable for this series. I've seen this. um this approach with a few customers now where there's a little bit of an all of the above approach. Mm -hmm. And I think the traditional way that applications have been developed is still kind of lingering around and hanging around um, because of comfort levels and things like that. I think there's an element of vir traditional virtualization that's hanging around because of comfort and knowledge level and all of that stuff. But I, what I'm seeing more of is, um, as cloud gets adopted, I'm seeing more of refactoring of workloads becoming the norm and the commoditization of the hypervisor, the type one hypervisor that might be, may or may not be running underneath that. So where I see a lot of our bigger customers leaning now is, okay, we, uh, we've got a year to figure to kind of take a status inventory and inventory of all of our workloads and they need to get dealt out into okay that one's getting prioritized we don't need the full stack anymore let's just containerize the hell out of it and run it in ecs like they that that's happening and some of mm -hmm. them are so you've got ecs you've got eks you've got the you got the managed kubernetes across the cloud providers but you've also got openshift and i think that's really a place where uh red hat is looking to shine is there i think they want to capture i may be completely wrong red hat i'm sorry sully everybody over there i'm I, Apologizing in advance if I'm getting this completely wrong, but, I, but my gut tells me that they're looking to capture that side of that refactoring decision that that companies are, are making when they do that and kind of be a bridge to the cloud and be able to run in whether it's Rosa or uh, other other managed versions of OpenShift extensively out into beyond their on-prem environment. So I think this is um, that's one of the steps that people are doing. And I also think that the big one for our conversation today really comes down to when is one of the open source solutions good enough and where do I need to step over the line and start paying for whether it's Hyper-V or Nutanix or VMware, where, do, where does that line in the sand? And I think that line's going to be different for almost every every admin every executive every, because they're going to have different budgets they're going to have different requirements and demands so everybody i talk to that line in the sand is completely different from the yeah. last two that i talked to how, how i mean is that does that kind of resonate with you is that what you're hearing out there as well yeah absolutely i think that um especially when it comes to whether you swallow the the pill and and stay with <laughs> with broadcom or not really is going to come down to a decision that you're uh, from a business perspective if i yeah. if i put business hat on business hat says that you know it depends on how much money we have how our how our business is doing in general how quickly we can move if we decide that we want to to stay this course and and potentially refactor move things into you know container workloads but also the tough one is and a lot of people myopically miss this you have a staff of engineers or support people who are administering a platform and some of them have been doing it for decades who have been working in vmware since that's that was what they started in and uh when you start considering the alternatives and how you do this you might have a staff that is the the lift and shift for them from an expertise level makes it so that it becomes untenable uh from a a business reliability perspective that you you can't just do that move that you'll just stay there 
and and hope that uh, you know, things will get better over time, or you can make your workload small, whatever, right? But th yeah. th there's an arc to it. But that's ignoring the fact that the 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 tough part of this change in the licensing cost has really affected the smaller businesses who are using VMware um, because they could have access to the best in class virtualization and they didn't have to pay a ton of money for it. I mean, VMware was and hopefully will still continue to be a, a company that was at engineering at its heart. They cared about the technology. They were less so concerned about making big dollars with it. And they were always pre Broadcom really willing to work with their customers to to find licensing that would work for them. That was yeah. one of their, I mean, I remember back in the day talking to when I, when we used to have VMware reps, we don't anymore really, that they would work with you and it would be a, we know what you wanna do and we wanna be your virtualization platform and we care about the fact that you're using our stuff, right? That was a big deal. So, but we now live in a situation where it's indifference. The price is the price and whatever you got for hardware, you either gotta make that work or we don't really care. That's that's a tough. tough. Part, we won't answer the support call when you call us. Sure. Yeah. Or yeah. you can just you can live with it. Um, well, I think to your point, and, one thing I want to comment on real quick sure. about I don't know that anybody actually buys VMware directly from VMware. Well, in the old previous to the more recent announcements, I should say. Sure. <laughs> I look at the the Cisco, the NetApp, the Dell, the the the. the technology alliance partners of VMware usually were the vehicles through which and the VAR channel partners that were attached to each of those vendors and manufacturers, that was normally the vehicle through which VMware sold at least perpetual licenses or whatever they, they, they sold. It usually came through some third party uh, in mm -hmm. the technology or channel partner system. Some of the first things I've seen were um, smaller partners getting shut out. Um, Dell killed their big alliance. I saw that mm -hmm. uh, the partnership that they had. I know they're reworking it, but who knows what that's going to end up like. Um, and they said that they're going to take their top, that publicly, I believe, they t they're going to take their top 2,000 customers direct to VMware. So these are kind of uncharted waters for the market. I mean, it's, right. it's not just a shakeup of how customers are doing business. Um, and using their products on a daily operational basis, like it's completely transitioning the market. And to your point about the smaller companies that were struggling with that, it's not just the consumers and the end users of the products. It's also the, the, the market in between the consumer and VMware. And right. I think that shakeup isn't talked about enough. Um, we don't talk about the, the resellers that have been responsible for kind of getting the, the dollars to VMware, if I can be blunt. Um, mm -hmm. and, and we're, we've been one of those for a long time now for, for nearly 20 years, uh, through vehicles like FlexPod and you know, other, other things, uh, that other bricks, other conf convergent infrastructure and hyper convergent infrastructure stacks that are out there do the same. And mm -hmm. people fall in love with those stacks of technology that kind of VMware gets taken for granted in a way, um, in, in those situations. So I look at this as a, one of the things I wanted to highlight was, um, and I think where you were going or where I was wanted to go next was a skills gap. When it comes to cloud, I spent the last five or six years doing cloud stuff as NetApp brought their portfolio to bear um, across the three major cloud providers. I, one of the things I noticed and that I harped on constantly, at least for the last couple of years, was the skills gap. And every time I talk to an executive at an end user, um, they always talked about how their st they couldn't transition their VMware or virtualization focused staff infrastructure on prem to the cloud because of the skills gap. So they mm. always had the conundrum of do I turn over my staff or do I train my staff? Meaning do I do I take the time and spend the money to train the staff? That could take 6 to 12 months if not longer to get them recertified, get them trained up, get them lab time, all of that stuff. Meanwhile, we've got problems now that we need to solve. Or do I turn over the staff and get somebody in now that has the credentials, but I potentially pay more for that, but at least we can solve the problem now. And somewhere in the middle, I they find a both or they'll augment it with a channel partner or reseller or somebody, that, a contractor that can come in and bridge that gap. The point I'm getting at here is that I don't think that skills gap 
exists between the different hypervisors. I think there is nuance between all of the all of them. Um, but the skills mostly translate. If you understand how a virtual machine gets virtualized, if you understand how to install an operating system uh, onto a virtual machine, whether it's uh, Hyper-V or VMware or you know EC2 in AWS, if you know how that works, you're going to be good for the most part. The UI and the UX is going to be a little bit different and nuanced, but... It's not like a massive jump like Kubernetes or cloud native uh, jump would be. You're going from a hypervisor to a hypervisor. And I would encourage people to be a little bit more open-minded about how cool that could be. Uh, how, how the, the options that you have in front of you um, to be able to leverage a lot of that functionality. Sorry, yeah, that was a bit of a rant it, there. I didn't mean to go no, on that rant. But. That's great. I, I, um, we, I was... I was going to add to that by saying that we we forget there was a time when we were all transfixed by the ability to run virtual machines, multiple machines on a single piece of hardware. That that was there was a there was a period of time for for all of us where when you got into virtualization, you're like, wait, it's not one OS running; it's a whole bunch running, um, and they're all on this one piece of hardware, and they all can equally work. Like there was, and to to add to that. You're right. I think that, that that's one of the benefits of when once you grasp the concept and you, you don't necessarily have to go into the, the nuance of how each different hypervisor does what they do, because it's you can you can you can be super deep in it. You can be an engineer yeah. and you can fully natively understand that stuff. And that and, and that's awesome. But like you said, that's the one of the beauties of, of virtualization is that it was a transferable skill. If your company decided it wanted to move to something else, if it wanted to go to Microsoft Hyper-V because they, for whatever reason, even though the user experience sucks, uh, it uh, it's still virtual machines and you can understand virtual networks, right? You can understand these concepts of breaking things down and, and how that works. So I agree with you that it's the nuances in the application of the hypervisor, the UI, the UX, that kind of stuff, and, and understanding how they use API calls and, and automate yeah. things, either using Ansible or PowerShell or whatever your approach is for kind of doing that stuff. But they all have those sort of I mean, that's options. even extra credit to an extent, right? Yeah, when getting into sure. the automation opera, opera, uh, operational side of it. Like, I look at it like, have you ever configured a backup job before? Cool. It probably doesn't matter what backup software you're using. If you can figure out how to start a backup job, you can probably do it in any of the software that's out there. It's it comes down to the nuance of what's what support. Same thing with the mm -hmm. hypervisors. If you've created a VM before, if you've if you've transferred a virtual machine, if you've live migrated a virtual machine, whether it was VMotion or Hyper-V or any of the other ones, uh, it's I heard something really cool the other day. Proxmox introduced something where it will allow you, correct me if I'm wrong, and I want to he hear your thoughts on this one. I want to start going into these a little bit in detail if we can real quick. Cool. Um, they introduced a migration tool where you can literally add an ESX host individually into the UI and then sort of just suck mm -hmm. in all of the VMs that are on that host and it will automatically sort of refactor them and condition them and fire them back up almost seamlessly. Did you, yeah. Is that something that you did in your testing? Well, unfortunately, that came out very recently. And so yeah. that was missed. XCPNG has that a similar yeah. uh, tool as well that basically connects to vCenter or ESXi. It depends on you know what your deployment methodology looks like. You target the VM you want. You say migrate. It will shut down. It'll, it'll migrate the workload over. And then if you want it to, it'll kill the, the VM on the vCenter side and it will start up on the the XCPNG side, just like I believe Proxmox does the same thing. And so you just you have VMware this converter transition. worked the same way for for God's sakes. Like yeah. in P to V migrations, it was one shut down, the other one started up, and you yeah. had a little blip. But yeah, it was a cutover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those were. I mean, that was amazing times, right? And so yeah. I'm I was really really jazzed to see that's something that again when I was mentioning earlier about like the amount of the swell of like development that was going on, like Proxmox or EMX CPNG for that matter, at any time could have made a converter, but they didn't because they were in their niche and they were they were just fine with the way they were and they were happy with those those segments that they carved out. But now there's an opportunity and, and that's what is really exciting is that you're seeing that happen faster than I think most of us have seen in a very long time in technology yeah. where they are 
executing on these opportunities and it's really benefiting people who are looking for their alternatives. Yeah. And, and I think that's, I think we're just scratching the surface on this. I think that we've just barely like scratched the, the fingernail of, of what this is going to turn into. And I, I think as we see new partnerships rise, I think as we see, um, we've seen Proxmox take on some new partnerships. I think we're going to see some additional funding come into these traditionally more open source projects. Mm-hmm. Um, shout out to Oliver and the team over at XCP. Like I'm, I'm looking at this as we are on the cusp of what could potentially be. And you know what? I'm going to say it. It might be heresy. If Nutanix would decouple AHV and allow third party storage, I'm telling you, you guys would have a type one hypervisor that was production ready in the bag. So I'm, I'm looking at this in this, um, and to, as long as you continue to force people to use your hardware, you're, you're painting yourself into that corner. So at the end of the day, like we have options out there. There are, go- there are multiple, like if you're an enterprise, if you've got a big EA and you're using Azure, my God, you can use Hyper-V for free. Mm-hmm. You need yeah. SCVMM. Obviously you need to license sure. that as part of System Center, but I mean, that's a small add-on. You've got options above and beyond these open source ones. If you're not, if that's something you're not comfortable using, but look at the growth that these open source ones are are growing through. So that was my big takeaway for Proxmox. I'm not the biggest Ceph fan in the world. That's neither here nor there because I'm a storage nerd. But if yeah. from a hypervisor perspective, like it's great, it works. There, there's that the UI is a little clunky, but it's a little too, a little bit robotic. It could, they could use a UI designer <laughs> a oh, little yeah, with a little bit of spit and polish. Like that's going to be that, that product's been around for 20 years, guys. Mm-hmm. That was that they started Proxmox before VMware was really mainstream in 2006, 2007. And where it blew up in 2010, like Proxmox has been around for a minute. It's just been hanging out in the home lab communities for the most part. Yeah. Um, XCP, we talked plenty about XCP. Um, I have my own, as far as NetApp goes, we absolutely support Hyper-V. We absolutely support VMware. And I'm going to be making some more community-focused content around uh, Proxmox and XCP. And we'll see where everything else goes throughout this year because I, I, I'm not sure where this is going to go. I don't know that anybody knows what's next. It's really a, just a kind of finger in the wind to see where oh, yeah. things are blowing at this point. Um, and I think everything's up in the air. Everything's ready for to be judged. So I just want to be clear about like NetApp's position on this just for a quick second is that we're Switzerland guys. Uh, at the end of the day, we still support VMware. We're still wonderful partners with VMware. We still have the ONTAP toolkit for VMware. Like none of that's changing. None of that's going away. Just to clarify, in case there was speculation or rumor that anything like that was happening, I don't know why it's, it's not period hard stop hyper V we've been partners with Microsoft for God, 30 years, basically since our existence. Um, so I look at that. We, we helped them do SMIS a few years ago, like 10 years ago. So we have that kind of stuff out there when it comes to hyper V tier one Microsoft applications and uh, anything to do with Azure. Of course, we've got Azure NetApp files in the cloud, big partners with them, love everything about it, including Hyper-V. By the way, as a, um, if I can dangle a little carrot in front of everybody, you may remember about 10 years ago, there was something called Project Shift. This is public, I'm not spilling the beans on anything. It was out there, right? And it gave you the ability to use a quick little PowerShell script and convert li- convert and live transfer a VMware virtual machine to a Hyper-V virtual machine in automated. And that was built by Glenn Sizemore and company. Shout out to, uh, to Glenn, a uh, good friend of the show. Keep an eye on Project Shift. Hint, hint, wink, wink. It's still out there. You can still download it. The PowerShell script needs to be a little bit updated, but we're working on it. And then some. So hint, hint, wink, wink. Keep an eye on that. Stay tuned. Watch that space. More on that soon. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, that's kind of, as far as the open source stuff goes, it, community support is where it's going to be. That's where our Discord is going to come in handy. Um, that's where my content that I'm working on is going to come in handy. We've got other people internally that are potentially going to be beating it up and and running through the paces. 
Um, but I look at it as, at the end of the day, it's NFS, guys. It's iSCSI. It's Fiber Channel. It's like NVMe over TCP. What does NetApp do really well? Consolidated shared storage across all multi-protocols. <coughs> we, don't, we don't really care what you're mounting it to. You just For NetFS, you just need an IP address and a junction path. You want to do some file locking? Cool, we can support that. Like That's the kind of thing where, that's the position NetApp finds itself in today. We can do all flash high performance systems. We can do kind of down on the more commodity spinning disk, low end systems, in, and everything in between, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it's the protocol. It's how you connect. It's the integrations. Obviously, we've got tons more integrations and things like that um, when it comes to VMware. We've got a bunch of those for um, Hyper-V. And so all of that exists. Our position is Switzerland. We don't really have a skin in the game as far as what hypervisor you choose. We can support any, just, I don't think there's any protocol we can't support that you want to hang your v VMs off of. It's up to you. So whether you're using open source stuff or whether you're running the biggest and baddest VMware Hyper-V, et cetera. Like, that's, that's where we're at at this point in the game. We're going to have tons more stuff to talk about as we get towards VMware Explore later this year um, and, and things like that. Um, any, uh, do, Drew, do we have any questions in the, in the chat come up? I'm not seeing anything so far. Oh, James, so what happened to Project Shift? Uh, James, if you Google Project Shift NetApp, it will come up. It absolutely will. And you'll see some antiquated documentation at this point, but it's still out there. You can download it. Thank you for the question. Um, Rich, to kind of close the things up here, what, are, what have we not talked about yet? What are the things that maybe you've heard through your community or that you've seen out on the interwebs that are things that we should be keeping an eye on? Especially because we can be biased from the vendor. We can sometimes have a little bit of horse blinders on from the vendor side. <laughs> what are some of the things that we should really either take more seriously, focus more efforts on, how can we help the community and the end users make virtualization better? It's a good question. I think that uh, the, I, I said it a, a bunch of times, but we're entering into this unprecedented time where there's opportunities, there's silver linings everywhere. You know, I, I've been looking at this entire experience as like, okay, well, we, we, you may, depending on where you sit on this, uh, you may have lost your, your favorite virtualization platform, but, they were so good that that everybody else was was just bit players in, in a, a much bigger picture. And now there is a huge opportunity for a whole bunch of different hypervisors to actually have their day in the sun to really to really innovate and and grow the features to be feature uh, parity with with VMware, which most of the most of the ones that all the ones that I looked at in my uh, videos are essentially, but also to really pick up these some of the special sauce that VMware did in their own sort of way. And yeah. so I think from a from a from a vendor perspective, I think that what I'm seeing from a lot of companies and I, I would expect to see from NetApp and and basically everybody out there is now is the time to to engage with these other projects to make sure that the the products that are being brought to market are as agnostic and as, as powerful as they can be for all of the platforms so that you have this even playing field and you see, you know, a, an opportunity. Because we talked about XCP and G, and I'll go back to that one. Um, I know from the grapevine, I'm seeing lots of, like a lot of those educational organizations that got hit with these huge bills, they're lifting and shifting to XCP and G because they see the future in it. They That's more analogous to where they're coming from for VMware. So, you know, they're, they're getting their their future and they are looking at their vendors and and especially with like the stuff about veeam like all of a sudden these opportunities are opening up and and as long as everybody is is making sure that they are working towards making their their hardware and software as ubiquitous and compatible as it was with vmware then i think that we'll see just massive options and growth and, and opportunities to to move to something else and from a customer perspective which from my perspective is is the most important part is I want to, wherever I go, wherever I recommend to the, my company or to others, that it is as smooth of a transition as possible. And the way you do that is to, to have all the foundational components all on board, 
all working because you know they, they want to support those customers and and help them transition over whatever that might be do you do you see a world where we end up with some kind of meta hypervisor of sorts that can manage all of the other sort of type one hypervisor is there some like super management plane that can talk to all of them that do we get to this world where all of them are so commoditized that it's it's all just virtualization at the end of the day maybe we with qcal formats and things like that like does it get to a point where there's one great call it a wizard of oz if you will that can talk to all of whether it's proxmox or or vmware or nutanix or hyper v or whatever it might be mm-hmm. they can they can talk to it like, is there an opportunity for that out there I think you just found your million dollar uh, <laughs> business idea. I mean, really, uh, if you really. <laughs> there you go, guys. Somebody go build it. Because uh, they all have their own APIs. And yes, right. those APIs are distinct and, and unique to themselves. And like with VMware back in the day, you had you couldn't do that with free, ESXi free, right? But the basic license used to be able to, to get you there. And now things have changed even beyond that, but they all have means for it. And yeah, that would be a fantastic opportunity to have a one UI to rule them all, right? That didn't care. That, I'm not that gonna had... say it. I'm not gonna say the, the SP word. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and, and it lets you um, be agnostic to whatever the underlying hypervisor is. Like you wanna move yep. your workload to a different data center, doesn't matter what it's run over there. It'll do well, the Let's hook it up to the cloud center. too, and we can just transition it to, uh, maybe refactor it in flight to a container work base where, like I think 10 years from now, we might be working on stuff like that. I, I don't yeah. think the, I don't think the end user community or the enterprise is re- has the appetite for that level of, oh my God, yet. Like I think we need a minute to, to process everything that's going on here, but sure. 10 years from now, I mean, it's, could we have an AI Jarvis that just manages across hypervisors? I mean, where's the world going to be in 10 years? We're going to look back and at this conversation and it's going to be so trivial and everything we were, were upset about every, everything that everybody's complaining about on Reddit right now is going to be so trivial. It's, right. it's just not going to matter anymore. Cause look at where we were 10 years ago. Yeah. No, I agree. Every, That's... Yeah. It's everything was virtualized, but nobody had really touched cloud yet. AWS was really kind of just getting, getting going. They'd been mm-hmm. around for four or five years at that point. Um, Azure wasn't really, it was just started in 2014, I think. I don't remember. Yeah, but about, yeah. Yeah, somewhere around that time. And in that time, yeah. the, the leaps and bounds around Kubernetes, around uh, cloud native, uh, and now AI, that's, again, just a tip of the iceberg sort of thing. Like, I think we're going to look back on this and, like, people, <laughs> we cared what hypervisor people used. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be one of those kind of situations where we all look back and see how silly we, we were. Um, but it's very real and it's very emotional. And I wanted, to, I wanted to invite you on here and have this conversation because it can get heated. It can mm-hmm. get sort of, there can be some fanboyism to it. Um, oh, yeah. There can be some, a lot of FUD that gets thrown around. Um, so I look at this as, a, as an opportunity for not only NetApp, but for myself and our communities and all of that to sort of come together, be transparent. Let's have conversations about this. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? How can we find the, let's go back to the roots of what the V community really started as, is like nobody knows really anything right now. And we're trying to figure out as we go. And as people like yourself and as, as, as Tom Lawrence and, and any content that I can crank out over the next couple of months, like as that starts to make its way out there, we can sort of start to put together some ideas. And that's how communities start. And that's how movements start. That is exactly how the V community started. And then a podcast mm-hmm. came and then a show started. But all these things that are, people are doing uh, are important and all of them should, should be supported um, guys, go, please go subscribe to Rich's YouTube channel right now. Go get in his discord. We got links to it in the description right below. Um, definitely love the work that you're doing, man. Uh, thank and you. thank you so much for the honor of coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Pleasure is all mine. Thanks, Nick. Any final words for the audience before we get out of here? You're not alone guys. Everybody's going through this at the same time. So just, you know, you got friends out there and the community, like Nick said, the community is where it's at. Yeah, Definitely. All right, Rich, I got a few final words, but thanks again for joining us. I really appreciate it. And uh, let's let's do this again sometime. I would love to. Thanks, Nick. All right. Take care. All right, folks, there you go. There you go. Um, there is a lot of stuff happening internally at NetApp that I am not allowed to talk about just yet. Um, 
that is coming soon. We can talk about more of the virtualization stuff um, and things to do with VMware as we get closer to uh, VMware Explorer later this summer. Stay tuned. There's going to be a lot. There's a lot being worked on right now. I promise you nothing that you know and love is going anywhere for the time being. So just hang tight. Um, things move a little bit slower than, than I personally would like them to, but it has to happen. It has to go through the, po the paces and we will get some stuff out there. Meantime, you might see a lot more blinky lights going on back there. And that may or may not be an open source hypervisor that's getting uh, stood up in my home lab here. So if you follow my data center dude channel, uh, either on YouTube or on TikTok or both, you can find some of that stuff in the coming weeks and months because I'm going to do Proxmox and I'm going to hook it up to a C250 that you guys know that I have sitting back there. Um, and we're going to do some, so we're going to see what it can do. We're going to put it through its paces. Um, we're going to see what it can do there. And then I'm going to do XCPNG right after that. And Frankly, I, you guys know last year I was running a full VMware lab. I don't have those licenses anymore. So even I'm in a position where I have to be creative and come up with something new. And I think to, at this point, I've landed on XCPNG. That's where I'd like to sort of start my journey. Proxmox is cool. I like Proxmox. I got nothing against it except Seth. Seth sucks. But XCP, I think, is where I ultimately want to land as far as a hypervisor goes. I'm a big fan of Zen. I have been for more than a decade. And I, that's kind of where I want to see things land. And I want to play with it with NetApp Storage so that we can write up some content for you guys so we can ultimately get some best practices out the door because that's the kind of, that's what you guys crave. It's the kind of content you want. So we're going to work on some of that stuff more and more. But guys, I got to get out of here. Uh, Drew, thank you for running the show today. I really appreciate it. Allow me to focus on the conversation. Shout out to Mr. Wizard of Oz behind the scenes. Uh, Mr. Drew Claybook, our community's manager. And shout out again to Rich Teslo. Please check the description below. Go sign, go join Rich's Discord community. Uh, if you haven't, go subscribe to his YouTube channel and all of the other things that you can find. You can find links to all of the videos that we were talking about on his channel listed with specific links uh, below here in the description as well. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope you guys enjoyed this kind of conversation. We want to do more of these throughout the summer. Uh, we're talking to some of the partners uh, to come in and bring, have them come in and give their perspectives as VARs um, so we can have all of these different perspectives and be transparent about it going forward. But guys, my name is Nick Howell. I got to get out of here. Thank you for tuning in. Join the Discord. We'll have some announcements for other stuff very soon. Till then, take care. <laughs>